everyone. Welcome back to True Crime Buzz. I'm your host, Amber, and with me, as always, is Brittany. Hi. We are back. Back for part two. Yes. What are you drinking tonight? I actually switched it up. I've had a lot of wine lately. So tonight I'm drinking rum with a little bit of strawberry lemonade. Mmm, that sounds good. Let me see that Diet Sam's Cola. No, girl. I have a real Diet Coke tonight. A real, a real Diet, Diet, Diet Coke. Coke? <laughs> yeah, I mixed it up. Look at us being bougie. <laughs> I'm telling you, so bougie. <laughs> You know what? I'm not going to waste anybody else's time, especially my own, because I'm dying to hear part two of this. So before we go any further, it should be clear that this is part two of Eileen Warnos. Crazy Eileen. That's to put it lightly. <laughs> so if you've not listened to part one yet, please go back and listen to part one first or else this is just going to make no sense. Yeah, it won't make sense. That's true. So where did we last leave off? She got arrested, right? No, she was not yet arrested. Not yet arrested. Yep, they had put out all kinds of stuff on the TV and the newspapers trying to find Eileen That's Wernos right. and her partner, well, former partner at this point, Tyria Moore. Because her prints were, like, everywhere, and so they're yeah. like, we need to find this person. Gotcha. Yes, okay. exactly. And they had found, like, all sorts of stuff at pawn shops. Like, there was even a thumbprint, because she'd given her thumbprint at the pawn shop. She was just giving all them prints out. She was. So... Picking back up, on January 9th, 1991, Eileen was found at a biker bar in Volusia County called The Last Resort, which I feel is just, that's iconic and ironic. Mm -hmm. Definitely. She was arrested on an outstanding warrant, and the next day, police were able to get in touch with Tyria in Scranton, Pennsylvania. The police offered her immunity from prosecution if she could get a confession from Eileen. Tyria took this deal and returned to Florida with the police. They put her up in a motel and coached her on calls with Eileen. She made several calls to Eileen in prison, begging Eileen to help clear Tyria's name. Finally, three days later, on January 16, 1991, Eileen confessed to killing the men. She said the men had tried to rape her and she had no choice but to act in self-defense and kill them. Do you believe her? I don't know what to believe, and we'll get into why. Okay. On January 13th, 1992, Eileen Warnos's capital trial for the murder of Richard Mallory began in Volusia County, Florida. This was the only murder charge that went to trial because Eileen either pled guilty or no contest to the other charges. Eileen was represented at trial by Trisha Jenkins, a public defender, and Eileen was charged with first-degree murder, armed robbery with a firearm, and possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. The DA at the time of Eileen's trial was John Tanner, but Judge Uriel Blunt came out of retirement specifically to try Eileen's case. Wow. Yes. Can you imagine being in retirement and being like, gotta come out of retirement to deal with this? I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I also feel like that probably made Eileen's head a little big, like, yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. It should be noted that Eileen's accounts of what happened in all seven murders, including this one, consistently changed between questioning, trial, and beyond. And the prosecution used that in addition to evidence, her tape confession, and her lengthy criminal history to make their case. I did not know this. Under most circumstances, prior criminal convictions are not allowed as evidence in court. But under Florida's Williams rule, they were allowed to add Eileen's lengthy criminal record into evidence to prove a pattern of criminal activity. But don't you like think in all TV shows that they can just bring up your prior criminal history? Yeah, I knew that they couldn't. But do you know anything more about that Williams law? Like why they allow it? I assume because it says that it is to be able to prove a pattern of criminal activity and this is a capital trial that's different than other trials, that something like that would have to be established because you're looking at the death penalty in a capital trial, so. Gotcha. Also, during the trial, Tyria, Eileen's former partner, gave a damning testimony of the accounts of the murder of Richard Mallory. And on January 27th, 1992, the jury found Eileen guilty on all charges after less than two hours of a deliberation. Eileen was enraged and shouted, Sons of bitches, I was raped. I hope you get raped, scumbags of America. That's what she <laughs> hollered out in court. He 
<laughs> You're so good with that. I feel like if I was the one telling this story, it would not come across the same. You did it perfectly. To my local uh, cable station, if you need someone to play, <laughs> I think would not set me up. If you don't dress up as Eileen fucking Warnos for Halloween this year, I'm going to be real upset. You remind me and I'll do it. I do remember some of her one-liners and I do remember seeing clips of that one. I didn't remember the full thing, but like just to hear everything, the way that you did it was. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So because of that wild statement, I imagine that probably stuck with jurors the next day mm -hmm. during her sentencing. Oh, absolutely. Like, what? could you have not waited till after sentencing? I don't know. No fucks given we again. No, by now, there's no fucks given. And she is a live in the moment kind of human being. She ain't thinking about tomorrow. She ain't thinking about an hour from now. She's thinking about right now. And that is it. That's right. That's true. So, sentencing started on January 28th, 1992, and jurors were to choose between life in prison and the death penalty. Jurors heard about Eileen's horrible childhood, the facial burns and scarring she received at age six when she and her brother Keith started a fire with lighter fluid. Ooh. Yes. The abuse from her grandfather, that in middle school, Eileen started having hearing and vision loss and struggled in school. Her IQ was 81, which is low. 70 and below is considered mentally handicapped. Okay, so when I was researching this, they used a different word, but I couldn't bring myself to use that word. I don't like it. But people within that IQ range, so 70 and below, cannot be sentenced to death. So she was just 11 points too high. Mm, that was really close. The jurors also learned of the rape that led to Eileen's son being born and that at 14 she was put on a tranquilizer for her behavior through the school. A tranquilizer? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Oh my god. She was having behavioral issues in school and struggling academically, so the school recommended that she be put on a mild tranquilizer to try to help with her behavior. And then at 15, how she was forced into homelessness. They also mm -hmm. heard from people related to Eileen's grandfather, which... And my opinion is bullshit because, of course, they aren't going to say her grandpa did all these horrible things because either they knew and didn't do anything to stop it or mm -hmm. they didn't want to be associated with the serial killer. You've got some points there. I know you're supposed to tell the truth on the stand and people think like that, but mm, I don't know. People are real into protecting their reputations and I'm they sure are. they didn't want to be implicated if they did know and didn't do anything to stop it. So, Oh, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Like, they would say, oh, well, he spanked her, but that was about it. Okay. Yeah, they really took his side on things. <sighs> this whole story and this whole situation makes me so sad. I literally was crying, Amber, at this point. Because should Eileen have killed people or done any of her other crimes? No. But these family members, to me, demonstrate how Eileen literally had not one person that loved her unconditionally or tried to get her help that she clearly needed or get her out of that situation and not one person she could depend on in her whole life. And I just wonder if this would be a completely different story had she had someone, anyone. That's really sad to have a whole family and be someone in that position that needs so much help and no one yes no one did anything at well, all Well, even like her lover her partner mm -hmm. um tyria like eventually turned her back on her and then was like i don't want to get sentenced for any involvement in this and like ratted her out which i mean don't get me wrong if you did something wrong and you're offered a deal obviously that's probably what you would do but it just makes me sad like not one person Especially a grandparent who is supposed to be the sweetest relative you have, just by nature, were yeah. the most horrible to her, almost. Yeah. Alcoholic, rapist, abusive. Like, she was doomed from the start. She was. There was she no was help really for her. And that's a shame. Mm -hmm. But anyways, the jurors also heard from one psychiatrist and three psychologists. The three defense psychologists said Eileen had previously been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder and was suffering with these at the time of the crime and that those disorders combined with her horrible childhood and life made her unfit for the death penalty. Eileen's attorney referred to Eileen as a damaged and primitive child and begged the jury to spare Eileen. 
They also said that these disorders are consistent with her constantly changing her stories because, you know, she would go from like, I killed these men in cold blood to I was raped and it was self-defense or this person oh. raped me, but not this. Yeah. So, so it's always like wishy-washy and like excuses. Yes. But they said that those disorders are consistent with that. But I, f I thought that that was really sad that her attorney referred to her as a damaged and primitive child and literally begged the jury to not sentence her to death. Primitive is such a specific word. It is, but I also feel like it really fits Eileen Warnos. Like, I really do. She was very... No, it does. It does. I've seen many an interview with her and... She was primitive. I mean, most episodes we've done together, at some point we touch on, okay, so did they have any mental health issues? Like, she is one, mm -hmm. not knowing a thing about her and just seeing interviews, you know. She yeah. has either bipolar or schizophrenia or something. So, I'm not even shocked. Something's not quite neurotypical there. Correct. The state psychiatrist actually agreed with the psychologist that Eileen's diagnoses were correct and that she experienced impaired capacity and mental disturbance at the time of the crime, but he said it wasn't extreme enough that she didn't know right from wrong. He did agree, though, that Eileen displayed evidence of abuse and alcoholism and genetic or environmental deficits. So he said, yep, all this child abuse happened undoubtedly. There's evidence, you know, in her demeanor mm -hmm. and that's to be believed. She is mentally ill, but she should still know right from wrong. So even though the state's psychiatrist agreed with all three psychologists, none of that seemed enough to save Eileen because the jury recommended the death sentence 12 to 0. Ooh, Ooh that gave me a shiver. <laughs> I did not know this before now because I haven't really looked into it too much. But whenever you give somebody the death penalty, you have to give all the reasons why. And if there's any reasons why not, you have to also list those. And obviously the reasons why have to outweigh the number of why nots. Interesting. So they found five reasons the death penalty was appropriate. One, her previous violent felony offenses. Two, the murder took place during a robbery. Three, the murder was committed to avoid arrest. Four, the murder was heinous or cruel. And five, the murder was premeditated. They did find one mitigating factor, and that was that Eileen suffered from borderline personality disorder. Okay, but here's where it gets real messy, and I really am like, what? In contrast to the jurors, the judge found five mitigating factors, meaning five reasons that she should not be sentenced to death. One, Eileen suffered from borderline personality and antisocial personality disorders. Two, she may have been physically abused as a child. Three, her natural father and grandfather committed suicide. Four, her grandmother died an alcoholic. And five, her mother abandoned her as an infant. Despite this, the judge followed the jury's recommendation. And on January 31st, 1992, Eileen Warnos was sentenced to death by electric chair. Mm. I have a real problem with that. Although I don't know enough about, like, being a judge, because that's not my line of work. Correct. I mean, I guess, since it's a recommendation, I assume that he could go against it. I really don't think they can. I think it's... I don't know. It's literally, from what I understand, and I'm not a judge either, is that they are simply there to enforce the law. So even They're if they They're there to make that. sure that everything is completely legally performed. They okay. do not have say in it, except in certain cases, but they're literally there as, like, a referee. That's crazy, because, like, can you imagine having all these reasons why somebody shouldn't be put to death, but you have to be like, death. That had to be hard. Today's episode is presented by Clark's. Clark's story began almost 200 years ago when Cyrus and James Clark made a slipper from sheepskin. At the time, it was groundbreaking, a combination of invention and craftsmanship that's remained at the heart of what Clark's does. From the very beginning, Clark's has always thought differently. Brilliant ideas are what set Clark's apart. We are teaming up with Clark's and Podgo to bring you 30% off select items, including the iconic Clark's Desert Boot, by going to podgo.co slash Clark's. That's podgo.co slash Clark's. So, let's get into the other murders. So, remember, none of these went to trial, okay? Right. Because she either pled guilty or no contest. So, there, there didn't need to be a trial. 
So on March 31st, 1992, Eileen pled no contest to the murders of Tori Burris, Dick Humphreys, and David Spears. She said that she wanted to, quote, get right with God, end quote. And she actually made a statement to the court that in part said, quote, I wanted to confess to you that Richard Mallory did violently rape me, as I've told you, but these others did not. They only began to start to, end quote. Eileen was handed three more death sentences on May 15, 1992. Then, in June of 1992, Eileen pled guilty to the murder of Charles Karskadon, and in November of 1992, Eileen received her fifth death sentence for this murder. Mm. And finally, in February 1993, Eileen pled guilty to the murder of Walter Antonio. She received her sixth death penalty. No charges were ever brought against Eileen for the death of Peter Sims, since his body... No body, no crime. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no charges were ever brought against Eileen for the death of Peter Sims, since his body was never found. Eileen was then sent to Florida Department of Corrections, BCI Death Row, for women, but was eventually transferred to the Florida State Prison for execution. She tried to appeal in 1996, but the Supreme Court denied it. But then, in a wild turn of events in 2001, she decided to dismiss all legal counsel and terminate all pending appeals. She wrote a letter that said, quote, I killed those men, robbed them cold as ice, and I'd do it again too. There's no chance in keeping me alive or anything because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system. I'm so sick of hearing this, she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times, I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was spot on. Thanks. Thanks. That was thanks. perfect. <laughs> she would be so proud. I hope. I hope. <laughs> okay. Her attorney said that Eileen was not competent enough to know what she was doing, but Eileen argued that she was, and a court-appointed group of psychiatrists agreed with Eileen. Like, of course they did. So then, in 2002, Eileen started accusing prison staff of putting urine and dirt in her food and spitting in it. She also said that she was constantly subject to strip searches, tight handcuffs, door kicking, window checks, low water pressure, and catcalling. She also claimed to overhear prison workers having conversations about, quote, trying to get me so pushed over the brink by them I'd wind up committing suicide before the execution and wishing to rape me before the execution. Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about trying to rape somebody before execution, but if I were to believe one of the two statements, it would be like her getting her to commit suicide. Because you'll hear people talk mm -hmm. about people who have killed or done really like bad things. Mm -hmm. Whatever they did should be done to them. So that one's not too far-fetched for me. So right. maybe, but we'll never know. So Eileen tried to boycott showers and trays of food and claimed she was hungry and her stomach was growling and that she had to bathe in her cell sink. Her attorney stated that she just wanted proper and humane treatment until she was executed. Which, I mean, you know, that's not too much to ask. Mm -mm. I don't know because I've never been to prison. I mean, you hear horror stories of prison. But, you know, like, you'll hear people talking about child murders and, like, how other prisoners don't take oh, to yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? You go to prison for anything related to a child, they're going to mm -hmm. fuck you up in there. Yeah. So, if that can occur, I am sure that some of this could have mm -hmm. occurred. And that... I just feel like she had such a hard life. I feel like all our listeners are going to be like, what is your deal with Eileen Fornos? No, you said a true statement. She had a rough life. She did. And I mean, like, even in prison. Like, she's about to go out and it's still rough. Could she not get a break? <sighs> Anyways, ignore me, guys. Listen, I'm obsessed with Heaven's Gate. You're obsessed with Eileen. We've all got our thing. We do. Eileen we do. is yours. I have a soft spot for Eileen. Eileen fits in your little heart. Well, I just want to, like, go back in time and help her and give her a better childhood. I think that's the mom in me. You just want to go give her a big old hug and tell her it's going to be okay. I do. She'd probably, like, push me and spit on me and hit me over the head with a cue ball in her, like, muscle tee with her mullet, <laughs> but I would try. <laughs> just needs love. She did. She really did just need love. The world let her down. In the few weeks leading up to her execution, Eileen gave several interviews to filmmaker Nick Broomfield. They were laced with sadness, anger, 
and some really bizarre statements. Mm -hmm. She talked about being taken away to meet God and Jesus and the angels and whatever is in the great beyond. I do remember that. She did get very religious at the end. She did. But weirdly. But weirdly, not yes. Like, not like, I found Jesus and I want to be a better person and I forgive everyone. No, she made Heaven's Gate look really good. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. She, she would have been a member, hands down. Yeah. She'd have been the leader. Come on now. She this would. is a bad bitch. She ain't cutting <laughs> that hair, though. <laughs> no, she isn't. But everybody would have to cut their hair like hers. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. God. Okay, so now I need to ask. Okay. Do you think she was just killing men all willy-nilly because she liked killing? Or do you think she was just seeking revenge on the horrible childhood that she had? So you can have triggers as a victim mm -hmm. of sexual assault, rape, physical abuse, even emotional Anything, abuse. Anything, really. Have triggers. Yeah. And honestly, her entire life was like her being raped. And, you know, and I consider her quote unquote sex work at 15 rape because even if she was willing to do that, like these are adults and this is a 15 year old child. So literally right. until she turned 18, her life was nothing but rape. And I honestly don't know that any time a man touched her because she was obviously a lesbian. Mm -hmm. I don't know that those weren't triggers for her, like being touched by a man after being raped her entire life by men. That makes sense. By men she trusts as well. So right. I think that was an agitator. I think, yes, she obviously had mental health issues. Also, there were some opportunities, and she obviously, like, she didn't have a job. She, she needed money. She needed a car. She needed these things. I think that it can't just be as simple as, did she do this in cold blood, or was she mentally not stable? Because we know she wasn't mentally stable. Right. But if you're looking for the why she did it, I feel like it's a very complex answer that can't just be, like, how the jury decided, oh, it was just in cold blood, it was calculated, it was, because it's not just that. Her final interview was the most bizarre, though. She said her mind was tortured at BCI and that her head was crushed by, quote, sonic pressure, end quote. She said food poisonings and abuse worsened if she complained to try to make her look crazy or drive her insane. At one point, she yelled at the interviewer, quote, you sabotaged my ass, society and the cops and the system. A raped woman got executed and was used for books and movies and shit, end quote. Her final on-camera words were, quote, thanks a lot, society, for railroad my ass, end quote. <laughs> I mean, she ain't wrong. <laughs> she ain't wrong. She's a real poet. A childhood friend of Eileen's named Don Botkins later explained the hostility in that interview wasn't towards the interviewer, but towards society mm -hmm. and the media. Which I'm like, did that need to be explained? I mean, maybe to the interviewer Probably. individually. But she says it with such ferocity and like her eyes look into your soul when she's speaking. So I get it, man. I don't know if I could have interviewed her without pissing my pants. She was intense. So... On October 9th, 2002, Eileen opted out of a last meal and instead chose a last drink? Pretty much. Just a black coffee. Guys, she had just a black coffee. Not even cream and sugar. And look, I grew up with an entire family that they still only drink black coffee. And I'm like the odd man out because I have cream and sugar. But now I feel less of a psychopath because who's the real psychopath here? Oh, they yeah. all drink black coffee. I need my cream. I mean, I can still drink it because I was raised on it, but I do no. not prefer it that way. I don't want dirt water. Sorry. <laughs> Her last words were, quote, Yes, I would just like to say that I'm sailing with the rock and I'll be back like Independence Day with Jesus. June 6th, like the movie, Big Mother Ship and all. I'll be back. I'll be back. End quote. I'm so upset we did not video record this episode because you have just earned the Eileen Warnos badge in this Girl Scout troop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Did you practice? I it. Let me know. Did you practice? No. You did? Hell no, I didn't practice. That's so good. No, but that's what I hear in my head when I am reading these words. That's it's it. It's amazing. Y'all don't come for me over my Eileen Warnos impression. Y'all come for I'm her, you better it. come for me. But like, let's talk about those last words. Like, what? She, like you said, she's a Heaven's Gate member. Oh my. She thinks Jesus is an alien. But like, Independence Day, June 6th, like the movie. What year did she get executed? 2002. We were in eighth grade. I feel like I should remember that then, but I don't. Do you? 
Yes, no, I do remember hearing about it on the news and stuff and, like, uh, thinking, like, who is she and what'd she do? I found out, you mm -hmm. know, a few years later, obviously, but I do remember it because it was a big deal. Okay, so she was executed at 9.47 a.m. Let me just throw that in there for factual stuff. But she was only the 10th woman in the U.S. to be executed and only the second woman to be executed since they reinstated the death penalty. And so that is the tragic and bizarre story of Eileen Wuornos, or as I like to call her, Fancy Gone Wrong. And R.I.P. Eileen. Like, for real, though. I hope she is on that spaceship. I you really know? hope she does have some peace because she surely didn't get it in her life. And I know, I know she did awful, horrible things. Should she have done that? No, 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 no. But, you know, when people have mental health issues... And if somebody would have stepped in and, like, you know, gotten her some help, some therapy, some medication, shown her any amount of love and support, I don't think she would have been the 10th woman executed in the U.S. I don't think so either. So, I hope that she does have peace in her afterlife. You know what? I do too. I don't often say that about serial killers, but I do, I really do hope she has some peace because she surely didn't get it in this life. Love our podcast? Then hit that subscribe button and leave us a review. We're also on Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com slash truecrimebuzz and join today for access to all our exclusive content, including bonus episodes. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at TC Buzz Podcast. And check out our website at www.truecrimebuzz.com. Until next time, cheers! cheers.